Hi, good evening to all of you. And uh, welcome to uh, 82nd uh, Leadership Leaders Lecture on a very, very interesting topic, and that is digital transformations in uh, Indian healthcare. And uh, to, that, to do that, we have uh, Richard Dev Gupta, who is uh, Chief of Strategy and Operations at uh, Fortis Healthcare. And uh, before I hand over the platform to her, let me um, you know, uh, briefly introduce her. She has got close to about 24 years of experience and currently, like I said, she's the head of, I mean, chief of strategy and operations at Fortis Healthcare in Kolkata. Uh, and uh, like I've written in the chat box, she's an out and out healthcare professional. And she has worked in four different, uh, uh, you know, uh, I would say uh, companies and uh, all of them are to, you know, uh, some of the finest healthcare companies or hospitals in the country. And she started with uh, uh, Hinduja Hospital, uh, you know, where she has been. She worked for about two years and five months. And after that, she worked with another great uh, brand, I mean, world class institution called is Naran Health. Uh, so much so that you know Harvard Business School has done a case study on uh, this wonderful institution where she worked for. Uh, Then she has been with this uh, great institution, Fortis Healthcare, and uh, she joined there um, as uh, the uh, you know the uh, what do you say the facility director, and uh, she has gone on to become uh, uh, the current role uh, that is chief of strategy and uh, operation, and uh, uh, you know she's uh, as a you know uh, uh, you know senior vice president and head of uh, you know uh, chief of strategy and operation. She's responsible for the group level strategy. M and A branding, pricing, and operations, and you know, all that comes with uh, you know being uh, the chief strategy. But most importantly, like I've written again in the chat box, she has been a, a career healthcare professional, and uh, you know, in general, I would say, and most importantly, the kind of uh, uh, the uh, digital initiative that she has been, she along with, of course, her team has been running is phenomenal. And uh, to uh, I'm sure, like I've again written in the ch chat box, there we will have great action in science because I think as we get to hear, yes, we get to see, and we have seen during the pandemic how important this has become. But I think it is only given the fillip to the idea of uh, digital healthcare in India. But every company, uh, uh, you know, is making a great strides toward, and not just this one. The rest of the world is actually looking at India in terms of how we are adopting technology to uh, have a better uh, uh, you know, healthcare outcomes. And that's the uh, context. I'm sure you will have. Uh, all of us will have, you know, great uh, learning insights from uh, uh, Richard. Dave. Thank you so much, Richard, and welcome to this and uh, the 82nd uh, Leadership News Lecture. And thank you so much for your time on Saturday evening, uh, Richard. Thank you, Nagendra. That that was quite an elaborate introduction. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of take it over from here. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining in. Now, we're going to start with the session. And the format is such that we would uh, have, uh, you know, uh, me speaking for almost 25, 30 minutes. And then the rest of the time we would use uh, for Q&A. So the topic that we have taken today is digital transformation in Indian healthcare. And um, you know anybody who belongs to healthcare, and even for that matter, non-healthcare, because all of us, all of us are user of healthcare delivery sector. Either you're working in, in as healthcare professional, or you would have come across, or you would have gone to the hospital sometime or other as as a patient or a patient relative, right? So this is a very, very important moment uh, for healthcare industry while we're going through the digital transformation. Now, what is that we're going to cover today? We would talk about that why digitalization in healthcare, digital health component uh, in Indian healthcare, Indian health tech market, healthcare technology evolution, impact of technology in healthcare, tech transformation in hospitals, what are the regulatory framework in which the healthcare operates and challenges that, that's being faced and future of healthcare technology. So let's get started. Now, why dig digitalization in healthcare? Why do we need that? Okay, so without making it complicated, I, my simple answer would be that 
you know if i can uh, book my film tickets online right if i can order my food online why is that i can't uh, book an appointment online so it's as simple as that because we know that that healthcare um, is is not unique i mean every industry has been touched upon by digitalization right so healthcare is no exception so the simple answer is that having said that if you look at healthcare in india um if you look at the uh, doctors number if you look at nurses number and hospital beds uh, these statistics statistics are there in front of your eyes and this would give you a feel that you know we we are almost 60% of what we should have actually to cater to the population right so there is a shortage of nurses there is a shortage of doctors and so far so even the hospital beds so technology is helping us get through the largest problem of healthcare which is accessibility affordability and quality and we would in subsequent slide we would talk about that what are the components of uh, uh, digitalization which is capturing the indian healthcare delivery market so i would say telemedicine m health emr or ehr and cloud based erp are the most important things which are currently being talked about and organizations are working around this so when we talk about telemedicine nagendra touched upon that uh, we have seen that covid of 2 to 1/2 years have actually helped us expedite the digital evolution in um, across the industry and so healthcare is no uh, difference so telemedicine which has been there existing for almost 10 years plus but then you know, it got a different level of momentum when uh, covid came in uh, we know that that there was so many tele consults happening because people were not really interested and rather they should, we we discouraged them to come to the hospital right for the fear of uh, infections so telemedicine is here to stay i mean is is it the same uh, the is the momentum same what what was during the covid time not really but then because it is so helpful is so convenient and it can actually help us um uh, you know to a large extent get rid of the uh, problem which we have around accessibility within india if you see there are so many areas you know where reaching is virtually impossible uh, people don't really have good hospitals doctors um, numbers are very very less so those are the places which definitely can actually benefit from telemedicine government has done lot around this and <clears throat> it it can actually as i said that help us uh, to a large extent uh, uh, you know get rid of accessibility problem m health m health is for all of us you know so m health when we say m stands for mobile i in health um india by its benefit of sheer population is one of the country which has the largest number of mobile users in the country right and many many of us huge population actually uses a uh, smartphone right so whatever so when we talk about different apps related to health that's where actually comes as m health like i'll give you an example of fortis so fortis has got this app which has component for patient component for doctors and for healthcare workers so what we have for the patient is is actually where they can actually use it for health purpose store their records um book an appointment right and so on and so forth emr simply stands for electronic medical record or electronic health record now this has got uh, innumerable advantages to talk uh, uh, simply that you know most of the time when you go in to meet a doctor and if you're going it for the second time or even if you're going it for a follow up we know that that you know you carry a bundle of reports along with you right it becomes very cumbersome a lot of time many of you are working professionals you would have thought that okay let me just before going home let me drop in and see my doctors but then immediately you would think that oh i haven't carried my report so that kind of further uh, uh, delays your visit that maybe you can go some other day because you're not carrying the report so electronic health record is matter of convenience it kind of you know it's about continuity of care and it has numerous advantages so that's something which is currently being focused upon by um, hospitals by getting into electronic medical record cloud based erp some of you um, who would understand healthcare delivery sector we know that there is a front end of the service which is related to the patient and there is a back end of the services which which are uh, you know departments like supply chain finance hr and so on and so forth so to bring in efficiency your cloud based erp helps in making those departments 
uh, you know, but through uh, cloud computing technology. And the, the bubbles that you see here, these are the things which is actually as simple as social media. This, is, this has become an influencer for healthcare delivery seekers. Now, Indian health tech market, if you look at it, how does it look like? At this point in time, while we say the data is of 2021, is approximately 2 billion US dollar. And if you look at that 10 years down the line, where does this market stand? It is 31 billion. So if you look at the CAGR, it's growing at the rate of 35%, which is very, very significant. And what does it include? It includes diagnostic sector, consultation, pharmacy, um, you know, e-diagnostics, and so on and so forth. And if you just look at the parallel, uh, in parallel, the graph that you have, it shows that what are the, so if, if you look at just 31, how does it get computed? So you have 6 billion coming in from e-diagnostic, 10 billion coming in from teleconsult. E-pharmacy has the largest portion of almost 12 because you would understand that e-pharmacy is something in comparison to e-diagnostics or teleconsults, right? It is much easier to um, execute. And if you look at growth, uh, e-diagnostics would grow very, very fast. And, and C uh, CAGR, when we are talking about that, it would grow, uh, health tech market would grow at 35%, actually e-diagnostic would grow at 41% uh, GAGAD rate. Which are the companies who are uh, uh, playing in these different uh, health tech market uh, space? So I'm sure most of the companies you'll be familiar of, um, you know, more as a user. So teleconsult, if you look at it, that these are the companies which are there. So I've just listed down for ease of, ease of understanding. Many of these, you already know that they are the players who are providing. So today we have teleconsults in the market, e-pharmacy, e-diagnostics, EHR, right, or EMR as we call it, um, deep tech technology and other segments. How is it evolving, right? How does the future look like? It's very important to understand. Now, see, um, if you look at that in new normal, that the term that has come post-COVID, how are we looking at these clinical pathways to go? So there are three components to it. First, we would say that healthy living and preventive care reduces demand for healthcare services, right? So um, unlike to the belief of people, where people actually think that healthcare providers would like people to come to the hospital, get admitted, because that's, that's the business for them. Trust me, um, uh, as I told you in the first slide, that there's an acute shortage of beds uh, in the country. So most of us as, uh, as hospital uh, providers, healthcare providers, always remain uh, on this, that you know, uh, as soon as the patient gets, gets well, the patient should leave the hospital. And for, for and foremost, this is not the place, you know, where we can actually welcome people, right? That you come and stay with us, unlike hotel. So we also, as healthcare provider, we always want and believe in that prevention is better than cure. And healthy living uh, can actually prevent diseases. So if you look at that space, how's technology helping? You are aware, and I'm sure most of, your, most of you are using it, that if you look at ingestibles, okay, uh, injectables, Wearables, wear, wearables is like, you know, example, Fitbit that you wear or, or you know, when you count your uh, steps on uh, your mobile phone and especially iPhone and things like that, right? You have personalized app, you know, for chronic disease people like, you know, diabetic monitoring, heart rate monitoring and all of that. It is actually making people, so I won't say it's a curable thing. It's, it's a something which, you know, alarms you that you're actually not in a normal range and you need to seek help. And if you... Uh, seek help much before where you need treatment, your treatment becomes much easier, much, uh, it, the chances of uh, curability is much more, and it is also cheaper, because we know that, that healthcare is something which most of the Indians don't plan for, they don't really um, think that I would ever fall sick, and hence I should keep this money separately, right, so that's one part of it, now second part of it is, as I said, that with the shortage of bed, now, in-home and remote care enables patients to live as long as possible at home with dig uh, digitally enabled care. I spoke about the chronic care patients. So if you talk about the respiratory care patients, if you talk about uh, people with the kidney diseases, these are the, if you talk about uh, people with the diabetes, these are the diseases which is, you know, um, chronic. 
and you need constant monitoring, even for people with heart problem, you know, if you have a heart failure, right? These are the chronic patients who constantly requires monitoring, um, right? And this is where actually this comes in play that if you have this in-home remote care, which enables you to monitor yourself, again, the treatment becomes easier because your alarm is raised much before you're actually fallen too sick to be cured or, or you know, like a, it, a, it avoids a prolonged uh, stay in the hospital. When we talk about the hospital as such, then we're talking about integrated care diagnostics, sorry, integrated care diagnostics and treatment and ensures an optimal patient journey through the healthcare system. Now, here you see, um, when I spoke about the second part of it, home care, that home sensor, AI monitoring, you know, artificial intelligence uh, assisted monitoring and mobile healthcare, patient and service app, precision medicine. So this is somewhere where actually it overlaps. And then in the hospital, we are talking about bedside artificial intelligence, right? Biofabrication, um, telehealth, and so on and so forth. So this covers actually the whole gamut of primary, secondary, and tertiary care. Now let's look at it that uh, how does it connect both the sides? So one is the service aspect of it, and the other is the care or cure aspect of it. So if you look at from the patient point of view, right? So patient engagement, let's talk about uh, the app reference I gave it to you that Fortis has a My Fortis app. There is a uh, portion for the patient. So what it does is it has a lot of information, healthcare related information, which is there on the app, which you can read. It, it kind of educates you about the disease. It talks about the prevention aspects of different disease and so on and so forth. Also, digitally, we send you a reminder for your uh, appointments, for your health care, uh, for, for your health checkup. So that is, in a way, is a patient engagement. If I have sent you a notice today evening saying that tomorrow you have an appointment, please join us, right? That is how we are engaging the patient because there are times when you tend to forget that I have an appointment tomorrow, right? So that, that's something, just an example of patient engagement. Now, patient convenience. Um, we all have experienced, and in a while, we would not like that to happen. But then you do realize that uh, on, during the peak hour, especially the call center at the hospital gets very, very busy, right? Morning, uh, maybe eight o'clock onwards, people start to call up the call center on the numbers which are given uh, by the hospital that, you know, um, is so-and-so doctor there? Is he available? Can I get an appointment? Do you have an endocrinologist? And a lot of queries come in other than appointments as well. Now, uh, I think in today's world, no, none of us actually have the time and none of us like to wait for uh, somebody to pick up the phone. If it rings once, nobody picks up. If, it, if you call up again for the second time, third time, you really don't have the patience to call somebody. So this app, if you have, or if you can go onto the website and book an appointment yourself, that's where we are talking about the patient convenience. Patient privacy, all of this data is secured as per the data policy given by the government. So that is privacy part of it comes, right? If you have a hard copy, you always have this fear of somebody checking into it, even if even on the patient side of it. But then if you have it, a, you know, a report wherein you have a password, it's a soft copy, it's stored in your uh, uh, e-record, then there is a question of uh, no leakage of your uh, uh, reports, right? So and that's why that's how we say that it's a patient privacy gets protected. On the other side, um, care side of it, re remote care management, health information sharing, and variable de devices and remote monitoring is something which comes from the care side of it. So it is care as well as convenience and service standards. Impact of technology in healthcare. Now, not very difficult to understand, it improves accessibility. Let's take an example of, as I said, that. Um, uh, you know, um, if I have to travel to a doctor, if I have to travel to a hospital, obviously I have to slot a time, not only for the consultation, but also the traveling time. Most of the time, if I have to go to a doctor, I need to keep at least three, three and a half hours, you know, probably half an hour, half an hour, one hour of traveling. And if I reach without taking an appointment, there would be significant waiting time as well. So that actually can be done in five minutes through teleconsult, five minutes for you to book, or probably two minutes for you to book, 
another minute or two to um, make an e-payment and then you meet your uh, um, doctor over uh, a teleconsult and the doctor or the hospital staff actually sends you a, a prescription. Sounds very, very simple and easy. So it's an easy accessibility. When we talk about e-pharmacy, um, uh, I'm sure many of us are using it. When your parents are not living with you, they're there in some other city, you know, they are taking regular med medicine. Uh, some of the old people are capable enough of ordering it themselves. But even if they're not very tech savvy, you do it for your parents easily without worrying that, you know, oh, his medicine is over. Do I need to call some neighbor or whatever? So that's where e-pharmacy comes in place, e-diagnostics. Your reports are available online. Um, earlier, when, when I started working and, and, um, and Agendra spoke about, I worked in Hinduja Hospital. I remember while I would be leaving hospital, for home, there used to be huge line because that is the time when you get free from office and you know you go and queue up to collect your uh, reports, right? Today, nobody goes to the hospital to collect the reports because it's all available uh, as soft copy, like it's password protected and you can just access it. Similarly, home care for smaller procedure, once the surgery is done, right? do I need to rush back to the hospital to kind of get my uh, uh, wound cleared or probably get the, get the uh, stitches opened and so on and so forth. A lot of it can be done through home care because paramedic staff can visit your home. Now, quality care. Quality care, why we are saying this, we are constantly monitoring through digital devices and this helps the organization personalize your treatment with utmost accuracy. And that's where the quality also gets improved. Better outcome when we talk about, so through artificial intelligence and machine learning devices, it it gives us a better management, patient management, and it, it enhances the outcome as well. Um, now, better patient engagement, mobile and connect, uh, connected variables uh, have the capacity to access and utilize the healthcare services with real-time monitoring, okay? Uh, better and enhanced information flow. Your electronic, I spoke about it, that in case if you have forgotten your reports, we have it on the click of a button, the doctor would see it and kind of give you a consult or probably move forward with your treatment. So these are the advantages of digital health transformation in delivering care to the patient. Tech transformation in hospital, if we talk about, now, you know, this picture should give you a sense that A to Z, any department you talk about, if you go into the outer circle, from OP to IP to lab to pharmacy, inventory and stock, um, payroll management for the staff, because hospitals, you know, are, are kind of, uh, because it's a service industry, we have a lot of people working in, Right, so payroll management, financial accounting, security control, MIS, your bills, administrative monitoring, everything, you know, appointment and scheduling, everything is today tech-enabled, tech right? Now, is this the optimally uh, used? Are we kind of, have we reached the pinnacle of uh, uh, digitalization or uh, information technology transformation? I won't say that, but you know, I would say the success has always been, we have reached probably 70 and 80% of what we could have in comparison to any other industry, right? Now, and how does it help? It helps in assessment and planning. It helps in digital uh, tool selection, that which one we go for, training and um, adoption, um, then data-driven decision-making it helps in. There's continuous improvement and innovation, right? Uh, I'll give you a small example that uh, the discharge process, IT-enabled discharge process, which we have uh, uh, introduced, um, if, if many of your healthcare professional and those who are not also, you would have realized it that once the treatment is over and the patient is about to get discharged, it takes uh, quite a few hours uh, for hospital to do uh, the whole thing. This IT-enabled discharge process has actually helped us save on time where we were taking more times, where is that we can actually cut short the process and expedite it for the patients. All of that comes out as a case study and for us to uh, find uh, places to improve on. Leadership and accountability, obviously when everything is uh, uh, data driven, there is much more accountability because you just can't say that, you know, I thought, I felt, I, I feel like, you know, then you're not working on your gut feel only. I'm not saying that, you know, gut feel doesn't have a role because with experience comes the gut feel. You may think and what you may think may be right. But when it is um, data enabled, when there are uh, incidences to prove that yes, this works, then it becomes much more, the decision becomes much more, much more better. Now, um, let's understand that 
how does a, a, a hospital administrator or hospital leader can actually um, go into this process of uh, uh, digital transformation if their hospital uh, needs to go for that. So first and foremost, they need to understand the current mindset of leadership, right? So uh, while most of the larger hospital chain and, and uh, large hospitals, even the local, local players have gone for this digital transformation, but I think when we talk about Indian healthcare delivery sector, there's still a lot of people who are uh, yet to start their journey. They're still uh, living in the manual world. So at that point in time, one needs to understand that what is the uh, leadership mindset? Because first and foremost, they need to accept it that, yes, this is something which is going to make life easier. It's going to make um, uh, healthcare delivery uh, uh, easier. And it is also help the, it would also help them in business, right? Then we are saying that provi you provide them comprehensive education and information that how does it help um, to go for this uh, uh, journey? How does uh, digital technology or digitalization would help them? Then define the vision for digital transformation. What do you want to do it? I'll, and, and I'll tell you that even for a larger group like Fortis, we had our own challenges as to setting up the priority. What is that we want exactly? Because you can do A to Z, and I'll show you the last slide, which will tell you that there's so much that can be done. But where are you? You know, what is the kind of budget that you have? What are your priorities? What would you take up first, right? That is something which you need to set it up. But at the same time, while budget today may be a constraint, but when I talk about define the vision for the digital transformation, you need to look at the five years, 10 years down the line that where exactly you want to be, right? So today, year on year, whatever you, you might be doing, that should actually result in what you wanted to achieve for long term. Because today, if I take a software which does not have the interoperability of something which I'm going to introduce tomorrow, then you really do not succeed. You, you actually go backward instead of going forward. Now, next is engage in open dialogues for concerns. What would be the concerns? What, what? So uh, initially, I would say when, when hospitals started, one uh, major concern was that uh, care providers and the most important care provider being uh, doctors, uh, would they accept it? Would they be open to uh, uh, having, you know, uh, technology coming into the play? So those were the kind of dialogues that needs to take place. Then, most importantly, set realistic expectation and accountability. When I say set realistic expectation, it is in terms of deliver de deliverable and also it term in terms of the timelines. We being in hurry, a lot of time we said that, you know, by end of the year, this should be done. But trust me, that's something which just hurries you up, right? And, and kind of, you know, few things you miss out in the process. So what are the realistic timelines? What is that that I can expect out of it? Uh, those have to be very, very realistic. And, and accountability, while there will be multiple players participating in this, because do realize that, that, you know, it kind of cuts, cuts across various departments, right? So who would be accountable for, for what? That needs to be set up very, very right. Solicit feedback and, and adopt that. When you are going through this transformation journey, please make sure that you have regular meetings, you have regular reviews, and whatever feedback comes in, take that seriously. And if you need to make a course correction, if you need to adapt that uh, feedback to improvise on your plan, please do that. Okay, and lead by example. Um, as as leader, please lead by example. Show them that the, how it needs to be done. Otherwise, it will end of the day, if, if failure happens, it would end up in blame game like any other project. As I said, that physicians for us, especially in Indian healthcare delivery sector, becomes the paramount importance that they must adopt the technology because end of the day, they are the front ending care provider for the patient. Now, how do you go about that? Educate about digital transformation. What I, and trust me, I think it's a myth when we say that in hospital, oh, who's going to talk to the doctors? Would they understand? Oh, they are very intelligent people. They do understand. So please don't ignore them. Involve them in the process from day one. Tell them that what are your dreams are. So the previous slide, which I said, when you make your plan, please involve your clinicians. Okay. Create awareness of industry trend. Tell them that how uh, things are changing, how across different uh, industries, uh, information technology and uh, digital is playing a role. Then foster co collaboration. So I'll give you again example of uh, Fortis, right? What we have done is that anything and everything that we are doing, there are clinicians involved in that process, right? If I'm doing something that how the discharge process would happen,
please do realize that unless otherwise the doctor is writing the discharge summary, it's not going to happen. So they need to partner with you in every step and in every exercise that you're taking um, forward. Offer training and support. It won't work without that, right? Empower early uh, adopters. So empower early adopters means you would realize that even among ourselves, there are some people who are very tech savvy, right? There are some people who are not averse to it, but they do take time. Similarly, in the doctor community also, we have observed that. And if you have some people who are faster learner, who are much more open to the technology, please take them as, um, you know, empower them, give them larger role. Address concerns, if there are any, from the clinic clinician side. And I tell you, whatever concerns there is, they're very valid because they are the people who are constantly in touch with patient, your end customer, right? We are here, all here for the patients. And whatever patient, so, you know, what one one can decide in the designing room sitting in the desiring room that this is how the flow would be but patient will tell you that how they move around what they look for and the doctor is the best person who can actually tell you whether this would work or not work as long as at least it is the patient facing area so address concerns whatever they raise um, celebrate small wins you know once they start to write e-prescription even if it's taking little longer time than what they would have just prescribed it in in few seconds Right. Please do encourage them and small these uh, celebrate these small, small successes. Provide autonomy and ownership. Again, this, this kind of, you know, is valid for both administrators as well as physicians. Regulatory framework in healthcare. When we talk about this, I think it would be only appropriate to say that, that Ayushman Bharat Digital Health Mission is something which is a very, very you know, a uh, promising uh, project taken up by uh, Indian government, right? And uh, what are the core building blocks of this uh, digital mission which uh, 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 central government has taken up? DG doctor, right? Where all the doctors would register themselves. Personal health ID. So the whole population of India would have their personal health ID. They need to create it, right? Healthcare facility registers. So all the hospitals, all the doctors who are providing care, any diagnostic center, any um, uh, uh, pharmacy, all of them, they need to register themselves there. And most important part is personal health records. So all those people who create personal health ID would eventually would have their personal health records. So this, if you look at it, this completes the whole ecosystem of healthcare delivery uh, system. Now, how would it help? Now, if you talk about it, the, the different functions it would do is discovery. Think about a scenario where on a click of a button, you can actually see that which is the hospital that is closest to me. Sitting in a village, you can figure it out, which is the primary center where I can go, which is the nearest lab, which is the nearest pharmacy, right? Seamless booking. You want to uh, uh, take a physical or uh, teleconsult with the doctor? It would give you that reason because all the uh, eventually once it rolls out completely and it's adapted completely, DG doctor, DG doctor would have all the doctors who are registered practitioner registered into in that. So when you do seamless booking, if I want to see that if I'm sitting here, uh, you know, who's the closest doctor, who's the closest gastroenterologist, you would be able to access that whether he's sitting in the hospital or whether he has a private practice, you can choose out of that. Now, sample collection, because all the labs are also registered in that, you would be able to choose that who provides home sample collection and, uh, you know, book an appointment with, for that. Emergency care, ambulance services, think of think of a scenario. Because today, if even sitting in a, a metro city, if uh, God forbid some, some emergency, medical emergency happens at your home, you would wonder which hospital to rush to. What is the ambulance number you should call, call uh, for? You know, um, your ABDM would enable all of this track and check checking availability of bed think of a scenario where in covid you virtually called up every hospital god forbid if you were in that situation and you were trying to see whether they had the bed or that they did not but here you being able to see it that you know red means that the beds are full green means there's still 14 beds available this is the closest uh, or nearest you can go to and so on and so forth so that might, makes it very very convenient Big data analytics. I think this is something which has been undermined so far. But once we have all of this data collected with us, it's going to be a big, big thing because then you would be able to track down the disease burden. You would be able to see the infant mortality rates. A lot of parameters wherein, especially because at this at the central level, we government plays a role. 
you know, if we are talking about the reproductive health, if you're talking about the um, um, uh, maternal mortality rate, all of that would be available in the click of the button. Now, healthcare in India is, is a little complex because there's so many regulatory framework under which it operates. Now, when we go on to the digital health mission, please do understand that all of it will get encompassed into one. Okay, so while, and that's the reason I said that it's a very, very uh, uh, large project. It's a very optimistic project, but then once it gets com completed, it's going to be something which world would watch for. So Drug and Cosmetic Act, IT Act, National Medical Commission Act, Personal Data Protection Bill, Telemedicine Practice Guidelines, Clinical Establishment Act, Digital Information Security and Healthcare Act, and Ayushman Bharat Digital Mission, all of this has to come into a single uh, platform. Every regulation which each of these acts have needs to be incorporated into that. Let's talk about some of the challenges. Data privacy and security. Um, you keep hearing about you know hacking here and there, right? Um, uh, Ames Hospital data is being hacked. So like any other industry, if that happens, your life would come to a standstill, right? That is something and government is very particular about that, that there shouldn't be any breach of uh, 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 patient uh, data protection. So it, it is not that easy for us to implement. And each of our digital initiative should be in such a manner that it actually kind of uh, has the interoperability with the Ayushman Bharat digital health mission, right? So this is something which is currently being worked on. Now, technology integration, I spoke about it, that everyone would have some system or other some HIS system that needs to go and marry into a uh, digital health mission uh, final uh, product. Interoperability means the same, right? That it should actually talk to each other. Cost and, and ROI, trust me, healthcare, the medical technology, when I talk about, there's a lot that's happening. You know, you, you all have heard about robotic surgery. You all have um, uh, seen the way uh, uh, cancer is actually expanding and newer technology coming into the world, we need to invest into that. And parallel to that, while the digital journey is also on, there's a lot that one needs to invest into uh, these. And uh, immediately, like any other business, one asks ask us that, you know, what's the return on investment? And proving that becomes very difficult, but obviously the efficiency, the, the, uh, the convenience and all of that it brings in, it actually justifies that. Regulatory compliance, staying up to date with evolving regulation and ensuring compliance um, can be a challenge. Because as I told you that, uh, that there are you know, so many regulatory uh, framework that you need to keep in mind while, while you're delivering the care. Future of healthcare technology. This is my last slide before we open it for the question answer. So this is um, how it looks like. What future holds for us is wider application of robotics. Okay, machine learning and artificial intelligence, wearable and on-body devices, all of it are here to stay and it would further get improvised, it would further develop, right? Blockchain functioning into uh, healthcare, then consumer in the driver's seat. Today, consumer is very, very empowered and more technology use, uh, you know, the transparency comes into the system, which is good. And that actually makes consumer, which is the patient, puts into the driver's seat and investment to flow into the health tech for sure. And this is how the future of digital um, um, healthcare looks for. So whether it, it would cut across your preventive, chronic emergency and home wellness. And these are the kind of things that you can do. I won't get into each of these to um, save on time. And so that we can make this more interactive. And I would stop here and I'll stop sharing. And we would open this for question answer. Thank you so much. Uh, uh... Richa, I think uh, it's a, such a big canvas it is on healthcare industry. I think we have uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, a few questions and let me read out, uh, you know. The first one is, a, I won't say question, but then I think uh, he is, uh, I think, uh, some sort of collaboration. He's joining us from US, I believe. He, uh, the question is uh, from Mr. Mukesh Prusty, and his uh, question is, uh, this is a great presentation. My name is Mukesh Prusty, live in the US and work in healthcare tech industry with a large player. We have started a young startup company in healthcare focused on patient monitoring uh, for discharged parent, uh, patients. It's an AI enabled platform with devices based uh, monitoring. 
how the product is uniquely positioned, how do we partner with the large hospitals like uh, Fortis and others is always tough to get into. It will be great if we can get a chance to present our product. So I think uh, more of a collaboration there. Sure. Uh, um, most welcome to see the product and get to know more about it. Um, I, I would request Nandita to share my email ID uh, with, with him and then we can get in touch with uh, Sure. That. I think Nandita, please uh, share, uh, you know, uh, 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 Richard's uh, email with uh, Mr. Mukesh. Thank you, Mukesh. And uh, this is a question from Mr. Uh, Saptarshi Banerjee. His question is uh, how to expedite discharge uh, process for ICU patients using a digital process with the help of AI. How to allocate OT timings for too many surgeons with too less number of operation operation theaters in the multi specialty hospital? I think it's Absolutely, the case. I mean, of more, many of us have seen actually where you know the the, the 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 surgery or the operation gets postponed because of non-available deep theaters. Thank you, Sapdarshi. Well, um, so I I think there are two parts to the question, right? So, sorry, what was the first part? Uh, first part is how to exp expedite discharge process for ICU patients using a digital process with the help of AI. Okay. Now, see. Um, there's nothing specific, I, I would say, for ICU patient per se, but anything which is available in the hospital, right, that helps you expedite the process. So I'll give you an example of, um, see, uh, let's take a very basic example of chest X-ray. If you go for e-radiology or artificial intelligence enabled radiology, now um, that's something which we are evaluating for Fortis Network. What happens is that in ICU, you keep taking uh, uh, every now and then you keep taking your uh, uh, x-rays and, you know, and then you then wait for the reporting to happen. Now, a small example of expedite the thing is if you have uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, enabled x-ray reporting, you would understand that 80 percent or maybe more, more uh, your uh, uh, x-ray report comes out normal. Right. It just simply says that that, you know, uh, normal. So if you have that in your hospital, right? And I would expect that in ICU, there would be patients who would actually have something or other showing in their X-ray, chest X-ray. So if you can eliminate that 80% burden uh, for, the, for the radiologist or the person who's reporting it, then you, you're focusing only on the reports where actually something is wrong. So the reporting time actually shrunk significantly, right? So this is one of the ways. Now, second thing is e-monitoring. So the concept of EICU, when you have, right, it is humanly impossible that your ICU in charge or the senior consultants remain in ICU 24 by 7. In that case, when the ICU in charge is there and he knows that out of these 20 patients which, which I have in my ICU, these four are very critical. And if I have the app, which we have, right, in Portis, you can actually see that how is this patient doing? Because if I miss out on any red alert, if I miss out on any part of the treatment, Right, then obviously his uh, stay is going to get prolonged. Okay, so these are the ways how you can actually expedite by adapting either artificial intelligence or uh, digital technology by reducing the ICU stay. Very good. Um, this is a question from Mr. Uh, P. Uh, S. P. Das Gupta. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, um, of course, he's asking for a PPT, and uh, that's why I think got a PDF kind of thing, uh, and uh, not a question as such. Sure. I think we'll check with uh, Richard and come back to you, uh, Mr. Das. And this is a question from Mr. Deepak Kakanti. Uh, what is the technology development in uh, genetics and biomedicals uh, potential in India? Okay, there's a there's lot. And uh, uh, frankly, I'm not the right person to answer that. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot that's happening, whether you talk about cancer care, whether you talk about infertility, whether you talk about, um, you know, it's like uh, uh, future treatment. Okay, starting from simple things like that, you know, storing your uh, uh, cord blood, right? Uh, with, with that, the few, the the in future, whatever diseases you might have that can be genetically cured. So there's a lot of advancement that's happening in genetic care. But uh, for more details, probably you need to speak to a genetic uh, uh, expert. Yeah, I think the stem cells is something that you know people now are uh, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, this is a question from uh, Gaurika. I think some of it is already addressed, but then nevertheless, let me read out her question. OT scheduling using AI, how to go about it? <laughs> well, uh, we're far from that. But yes, it would be very, very uh, 
uh, important if we can do it. So earlier, I think, you know, the gentleman who asked this question had also said that, that uh, many a times surgery gets postponed because, um, you know, you don't have the OT availability. Uh, at the risk of uh, kind of, you know, being uh, typecasted that I'm kind of speaking against the doctor. But let me tell you, if you have been working in healthcare, you would realize that a lot of time the scheduling gets a little haphazard or the schedules are not available because we tend to block the OTs for certain doctors or certain specialities. My advice to you would be that barring if it is specialities where super specialities where you specifically need dedicated OT like, you know, your cardiac surgery, your uh, ortho surgeries, your neurosurgeries, please do not go by the whims and fancy uh, that my doctor wants it. It needs to be blocked for him because morning OT should start at 7.30 or 8 o'clock, right? And should go on till the time patients are there. And there has to be a time slotting done. Now, in terms of artificial intelligence, I'll tell you very frankly, I wish if that could be implied for, because you would realize that the same surgery, some doctors take longer than the other doctors, right? Some doctors, first and foremost, uh, you know, it's just about the surgical skill and there's nothing good or bad about it, right? So somebody uh, for a lap coli might just take uh, uh, 40 minutes. Somebody may uh, go on for two hours. And at that point in time, if you have, if you kind of keep noticing it, right, your AI can actually help that XYZ doctor takes much longer than ABC doctor and hence his package, the doctor who's taking longer because, you know, every uh, uh, every uh, infrastructure or every resource needs to be built, need to be kind of accounted for. In that case, if you tell the doctor that your patient actually, his surgery would cost 5,000 extra because you're using the OT for similar kind of a case for a much longer time, this is how AI can help. But I do not think we really have uh, uh, AI that much enabled because this needs to be tailor-made for you, right? You need to have your own estimations. You need to identify who these doctors are. You need to uh, book the time slots, looking at the algorithm of that, okay, on an average in my group, if I do 300 uh, uh, lap coli, what's the average time does it take, right? If 20 um, uh, uh, surgery or 20% takes much longer, then I need to have a, a package which is a little more expensive or probably my doctor needs to be counseled to be a little faster. Great. Uh, this is a question from uh, Neeta Karmakar. Her question is, how do you help monitor critical patients at home? For example, any patient who is uh, on home or ventilator, how do you help the nurses taking care in case of emergency? Thank you, Neeta. Well, um, you know, um, uh, it can be easily done by EICU, but EICU is a concept which is far and few in India today. Okay. So uh, EICU, and that also has a limited scope at this point in time. In Fortis, we did have EICU, wherein what we would do is that, uh, say, a hospital, largest hospital in Delhi would actually monitor ICU of uh, places like Amritsar or Jalandhar. But then, so far, at least I'm not aware of wherein you actually can connect your uh, ventilator or home ICU concept, what we talk about, into some hospital. But I would kind of you know, love to reach a day where we can actually do that as well. Thank you. And uh, this again, uh, um, in the last two questions, I would say, uh, one is a more of an advice uh, uh, that uh, Mr. Das Gutta seeking his, uh, you know, question is, being a biomedical engineer, what is the role of uh, me, ma'am, in the digital transformation idea? Can you please uh, describe? Yes. Um, see, uh, he has a large role to play because most of the, so, you know, I spoke about uh, interoperability uh, repeatedly. Now, what's happening is all the um, medical equipment which is which are getting manufactured, right, are actually um, uh, IT enabled. It, it what it means is that whatever you have, it actually can be transmitted. So let's let me take an example that if I'm doing an eco, if I'm doing an ECG, the outcome which comes as a printout today has the capability that if you can connect your medical record, it actually can get transferred. The image or the, or the graph can get transferred into that machine, right? And this is where he as a biomedical engineer needs to know that how does it kind of club into the software that the company has or the EMR the company has. So he'll need a little bit of a training and then he becomes the conduit or the person who actually helps do that. Thank you. And uh, last uh, question for today evening uh, is from Rajiv uh, B. His question is, while data can really do great things, hospitals are reluctant to share. How this challenge uh, uh, can be handled? Thank you, Rajiv. 
Uh, what kind of data are we talking about? Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe uh, uh, with other uh, you know participants in the ecosystem, maybe with okay. insurance. So, so, so I, I'll tell you what. Um, I can't uh, share any data, patient-related data, unless otherwise I have a consent from the patient. Okay, so that's very clear. Um, and uh, the day that this digital health mission gets rolled out completely, I don't think I would have a choice to share or not share, right? I have to share. Because if, uh, as a patient, if I'm coming to uh, uh, Fortis today, tomorrow I may be in a city where Fortis is not there. And then you have to give access to my data so say for suppose if I'm I'm um, I'm in Hyderabad that if I want to go to care hospital, you have to give care hospital access to my data so that they can tell me what's the next step of treatment, right? So that would solve the issue. And if you're talking about uh, more to do with the administrative data, MIS, and so on and so forth, see it it remains uh, kind of uh, uh, proprietary uh, uh, data or details of the hospitals. I don't think there is any compulsion to share that. Thank you so much, uh, Richa. I think uh, uh, you know uh, for your wonderful uh, presentation as well as I think I think uh, because we are almost uh, hitting uh, seven o'clock, we have to cut short. But uh, absolute pleasure having you for uh, this wonderful topic, and I'm sure some of them uh, would be reaching out to you uh, directly, uh, maybe through LinkedIn and other means, sure. and uh, you know seek your advice. But from all of us at Times Pro as well as from all of our participants, thank you so much for joining us and you know, sharing your insights. I, I mean, wonderful. I think, uh, you know, being a career uh, healthcare, uh, very rare to get to see it, except of course the doctors are different, but then from the management side, uh, growing to be in the same uh, uh, industry is very rare. But uh, thank you so much from all of us once again, Richa. It was a pleasure with the, being with you, all of you, right? I couldn't see the participant, but uh, looking at the questions that I have received, I, I can see that they were an absolutely engaging uh, uh, audience. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Richard. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.